All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you to everyone for joining us for today's webinar. This webinar is reopening your audiology practice in the wake of COVID-19. My name is Bobby Powers on the Gravity Payments team. I'm the head of learning and development here at Gravity, and I have the privilege of introducing our speakers today. So with us, we're joined by Brian Urban, president of Counselier. Brian is a former practice owner from Evanston, Illinois. He's also a past president of the Academy of Doctors of Audiology, an adjunct faculty member at Rush University, an advisory board member for Salus Osborne College of Audiology, and a distinguished fellow in the Audiology Academy of the National Academies of Practice. Brian's mission is to help people who help people here. And we're also joined by Dan Price, founder and CEO of Gravity Payments. Dan founded Gravity when he was just 19 years old. His mission was and is to help hardworking small business owners stay competitive against larger corporations by making credit card processing transparent, fair, and easy. Today, nearly 20,000 independent businesses across all 50 states trust Gravity as their processor. Dan captured national attention back in 2015 when he cut his seven-figure salary and raised the company's minimum salary to $70,000 a year. His leadership has earned him many awards, most notably Entrepreneur Magazine's Entrepreneur of 2014 and the 2010 SBA National Young Entrepreneur of the Year awarded to him by President Obama. Dan lives in Seattle and is the author of the new book, Worth It, How a Million Dollar Pay Cut and a $70,000 Minimum Wage Revealed a Better Way of Doing Business. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dan and Brian. Let's welcome them and I'll turn over the floor to them. One note, just for logistical purposes for today's webinar, you can submit questions and answers at any time using the little Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen. All right, Dan, Brian. Thanks, Bobby. Good to see you, Dan. It's been a while. Hey, Brian, nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's a, a real uh, a pleasure, and I really have enjoyed my time, you know, getting to know all the audiologists and just being a part of this industry and getting to know you and, and everybody that you work with every day. I wish it was under better circumstances that we were chatting, but I'm really happy to, to be here with you and happy to have so many people out there joining us. Yeah, yeah. Likewise, and and I think um, obviously I'm really excited to, to to have you join as well because one thing that um, I th you know a lot of business owners uh, on this call and uh, there's a lot of commonalities between you know business owners in different parts of the the, the financial spectrum and so um, oftentimes we get kind of pigeonholed in our this is what audiologists do. This is what hearing hair, hearing healthcare providers do. This is what restaurant owners do. Um, but this, as we've seen, is affecting everyone. So really, you know, appreciate you being here and your insight. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would love to actually maybe start off by throwing a question to you, uh, if you don't mind. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has had effect on everyone. It's had a huge effect on your business. Um, what were some of the tough decisions you guys had to make and what were your priorities, priorities as you, you know, address them? Yeah. So um, in late February, uh, we started to see a, a drop in processing volume. We're in Seattle, which was the original epicenter of COVID-19. Um, there was a nursing home here that had a lot of the first deaths and the first kind of national news of COVID-19 was here in Seattle. And we started to see places like dining establishments, you know, start to drop a little bit. And, uh, and that was concerning. And it was like, we were, we had an eye on it. And also we at Gravity, we had closed down our office pretty early at that point. And, you know, it's, it was hard to know what to make of it, but it was like, well, worst case scenario, if we close down our office, it'll be a really good fire drill for a situation like this, right? Because we all know that pandemics can happen, viruses can happen, they're unpredictable. And we always think, oh, you know, not right now, not to me, all this kind of thing, but sometimes it does happen. And so we, we decided very early to close down our office and to just start having everybody work from home. And I was really proud of that, that our team did that and, and looked at early 
you know, what would be the effect on the economy? What would be the effect on so many people? And most importantly, what would be the effect on people's health if something like this broke out? So we said, well, we're just going to do everything we can to try to prevent an outbreak, which at that time meant canceling all work travel and having people not commingle at all. Um, so we were on that early, but we weren't seeing much of a drop at that point in terms of the economy, just a little bit in, in restaurants and those things. And over the next three weeks, we were seeing 20 and 30% declines week over week over week. And we started looking at some of the social distancing measures and I was um, thinking about it and it just seemed like, you know, if you were going to create some type of a stay at home order, you would have to do that in a sequenced way. You couldn't go from having the economy be completely open to completely closed in a second. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like those sequences were, were going on. And of course, you know, we weren't being told that was gonna happen. I don't know who knew and who didn't, but we started to see some of those patterns and we were thinking about the implications. And then Washington was one of the first states to in fact issue a stay at home order. And so we were we were sounding the alarm for the entire country of, you know, the the repercussions, which meant a lot of our twenty thousand small business clients, many of whom are are on the call right now, their revenue went to zero. Yeah, we had a few that were going up, but on average across all of our small business sectors, it went down by fifty five percent. And that meant we normally eke out kind of like a half million dollar profit. I mean, that's a lot of money, but for the size of business that we have and, and the debt load that we carry and those things, it's kind of mm -hmm. like a conservative amount of profit. It's not, it's not really any more than what you need to you know, stay in good graces of banks and financial institutions and whatnot. And so we went from having a half million dollar monthly profit to a $1.5 million monthly loss over the course of a couple of weeks. And before we got down to the bottom, like a week before, we got the entire company together on a Zoom call like this with everyone working from home, 200 people. And I said that I thought we were gonna lose half of our revenue and it ended up being 55%, like I say, mm -hmm. but at $1.5 million in monthly loss, we, we don't have a ton of savings. We had like a $6 million line of credit that was available to us. So we're looking at that and we're saying, you know, if everything goes perfectly from here forward, we have four months. And that was su super scary. But on the other hand, you know, we had a lot of small businesses that needed tools either right now or for their reopening, needed tools, technologies, features that, that were essential for them that would allow them to either start better or protect some of their revenue in the meantime. And we needed to be building and deploying those. Right. And so it was, it was tough because we all of a sudden had 10 times more work to do and half the money to do it. And so you think about things like layoffs, which we're so, so proud of that we've never done, you know, as something that's really probably like totally necessary. The other thing that our competitors do is they often charge a 50 or 60 or $100 per month fee. And many of them will use these times and feel forced to add those fees on. And we're like, you know, adding a fee to small businesses right now when their revenue may have just gone to zero just seems like a, a terrible thing to do and completely antithetical right. to everything we stand for. And so I was really in one of those situations where there was no right answer. Like every single option in front of me was something that I would swear that I would never do. And in that situation, it was important to me to just say that to all 200 people that work at Gravity and to walk them through the, the math in brutal detail of what mm -hmm. had just happened and figure out like, how are we gonna make this work? Um, and our team came together and said, we wanna be there for small businesses. And we were able to uh, cut out about a million dollars of expenses within a week, all without hurting any kind of smaller vendors, smaller businesses. About half of that was um, expenses that we could find, you know, efficiencies that we could find inside of our business. But that only got us to a half million in savings, still losing a million a month. And our team was saying that that was not good enough. 
So our team said, why don't we open up almost like a, a, a anonymous fundraiser? Let's just open up a, a Google spreadsheet that people can go into and say what they can do, what they can change. And mostly pretty much every single employee at Gravity said, I can work extra hours, I can do extra things to be there for our small business clients when they need us. But the other thing that was probably even more shocking was 98% of people wrote on that spreadsheet that they wanted to decrease their pay on an anonymous voluntary basis. And this is not something where I, I've had other CEOs hear this and be like, oh, cool, I'm going to get all my employees to decrease their pay too. And it, it wasn't like that, you know what I mean? It was like, the, the, it was like the, the idea was just to be transparent and make it, instead of making it my problem as the CEO, make it our problem as a company. Spread that problem out and recognize that the company as a whole is a whole lot smarter than me on my own and work on that problem together. And then the first idea that came up was like a democratic solution. Like let's vote on something to include everybody. But the concern was, well, if you have one person who is raising a family and their spouse just got laid off yeah. and they're already in dire straits, that's very different than one of the guys on the call literally said, he said, my wife makes way more money than I do. So he's like, I can work for free or for half or whatever. And he, he said that on the call publicly. It was pretty funny. But it, what we found was we had a huge amount of diversity. You know, there's the whole thing with COVID-19, which is we're all in this together. And that's very true in the sense that it multiplies so quickly, at least according to what the scientists are telling us right now and the public health experts are telling us, that like, if we don't all beat it together, then we can't mm -hmm. defeat it. But what's also true is it doesn't affect everybody the same way. I mean, some people are mourning uh, the death of a loved one uh, and in financial dire straits, and other people are just able to spend a bit more time with their kids and are feeling like, you know, outside of other people hurting, their life has not been negatively affected in a direct way. And so we recognized that diversity and we decided not to go with that democratic solution that the employees decided, they decided, let's just see if we can get there. And we were able to get to a million dollars in monthly savings in a week, which extended our runway out to 10, 12 months. Um, okay. And then we also uh, went for the PPP loan. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not somebody who's like rushing to try to get in line to get ahead of other people for government assistance or those types of things. But our bankers and our accountants and all those people encouraged us that this is tailor made for your type of situation. You lost 55% of your revenue, but you need all your employees. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for somebody who has no work to give the employees, it's not quite, it, it doesn't fit as well. It, it can work for some, but it's not tailored made. And then there's others that I've heard. There's a gentleman that told me his e-commerce business is up 40%. And he's doing great. And his bank's trying to get him to take the PPP loan. So that's obviously not what it was intended for. Right. So we went for that. Um, we just found out actually this morning that we got it. Great. <laughs> so it was like a, it was a three week process, but that buys us realistically an extra four months now. So that nice. takes us out, you know, 10, 12 months for us to figure out how we can help our clients, including in your industry, to be able to get some revenue flowing again because uh, your revenue is exactly correlated to our revenue. All, all of our small business clients, we don't make money unless you make money. And so, you know, that gives us time to figure out how to help those businesses, including audiologists, you know, get back up and running again. Yeah. Well, it's great. I mean, I, 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 mean, I love the, the approach. And I know you've had some stuff on LinkedIn as well where you're really focused on not only supporting your current uh, uh, customers, but also growing too. And, and you know, there's some correlates for me with within the hearing healthcare space and that, um, I mean, you're basically saying, hey, we're not going to just tread water. We're not going to hold our breath and just see if we can wait this out. We're going to actually, you know, charge into this. Uh, charge, that's funny. Um, <laughs> but the, um, yeah, uh, on the audiologist side of things, one thing I've been hearing a lot from audiologists is sort of you know, sort of what should I even be doing right now? Like what, my hands are free, I don't know what I'm doing right now. Um, and in some of the practices I've been hearing from that have really, I think really uh, embraced this uh, is they are really connecting with patients. I mean, they're using their database as well to identify patients that they need to check in with routinely, 
right? So not just waiting and saying, okay, when we can open our doors, you know, some patients will come back in. It's like, no, no, let's be proactive. Let's connect with them, uh, you know, through various forms of technology, obviously telehealth, through uh, calling, through e you know, e uh, email blasts and texting, um, but also going a step further and saying, you know what, now is actually a really amazing time to get new patients right? Mm -hmm. This is not just a time where we're going to, you know, uh, focus only on a certain set. We're going to say, hey, let's be proactive of this. Let's post on social media channels. Let's reach out to the referring physicians and let them know all the creative stuff we're doing. We're doing curbside. We're doing, you know, uh, very specific infection control management now, and we're ramping that up so we can open our doors. So they're getting this very clear message out. I mean, I saw um, a clinic in Colorado sent out this series of just gorgeous emails. I rarely would ever say that, but it was tons of content. It was very personable and they had videos from their providers. So any patient receiving that is like, I'm being taken care of, even though I'm not you know, doing business with this clinic right now. And yeah. I, I, I can guarantee you those clinics are going to come out of this stronger. I mean, they're going to come out quicker than other clinics and, um, and uh, you know, with, with a lot of energy. So one, one thing that comes up for me, and I appreciate you sharing, sharing all that, that's, that's really encouraging. Um, our small business community and, and, and audiologists especially, you know, make such a positive difference in our communities as employers, as service providers, as hearing healthcare providers. And, um, you know, this is a, it's an existential threat and it's also an opportunity. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about kind of how I think about the opportunity and the growth strategy of a situation like this. Whenever that topic comes up, I always, and I recommend every single person out there, stop for a second and acknowledge just the pain that so many people are in and the heartbreak that we're all feeling. Because we can't be paralyzed as leaders. We have to you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? And we can make a bigger difference over the next year than we have. I mean, we say at Gravity, we can make a bigger difference over the next 16 months than we have the last 16 years. So you're absolutely right about the opportunity, but I want to acknowledge that this is just a heartbreaking situation in so many ways. Um, you know, I've lost a loved one and so many people out there have, and there's a tremendous amount of grieving and concern and stress and, and upheaval. The rug's been pulled out from, from yeah. under all of us in different ways, but some more than others. Right. And so I think for us as leaders, we have to lead with that level of empathy. And I will, we all have different styles. So I'm not gonna recommend that everybody do it the way I do it, but I think find some way to honor that grieving that's happening for yourself and for other people. And I've readily admitted to my team that I spend most days, you know, maybe as much as a half hour, like bawling my eyes out. <laughs> um, but the other 23 and a half hours, I'm doing everything in my power to, to fight for what I care about, right. to fight to save small businesses because one of the trends that was already happening was business was shifting to being more digital. And you and I talked about that at, mm -hmm. at the conference where we were talking and right. where many of the people on the call uh, heard us talking about that. That, tra that transition to digital is both an opportunity and a threat, but in general, it served as somewhat of a consolidating mechanism in the business world to give more of the wealth and power to few, relatively fewer companies mm -hmm. and to have more and more companies that are kind of starved out. So a couple stats, small business formation is down 40% from its peak right now, or even before the crisis. The, the, the amount of profit that goes to the top 100 companies in the US, the percentage of the total profit over the last 40 years has gone from around 40 plus percent to a little mm -hmm. bit less than 90%. And so these are staggering statistics that, that have implications on all of our lives. But one of the reasons why is it's harder when you're running a small business and you're busy and you're adding a lot of value and you're trying to pay your employees well and you're trying to do everything you can to be a good small business owner, to be a good audiology practice owner, it's tough to take a pause and think strategically about marketing to think strategically about brand and to think strategically about digital. 
how am I going to upgrade my systems? How am I going to think about setting myself up so that my employees can do a better job of being customer facing and they don't have as much in terms of repetitive tasks and things like that to work right. with. And those are all the transitions that small businesses in general need to compete in the age of Amazon and Starbucks and Facebook and social media and the internet and everything else. And so this has been an accelerating mechanism where some of the top companies in the world, you know, Amazon, for example, um, their market value has gone up by like $100 billion just in the last couple months. And the value of small businesses has fallen in half the same period of time, or at least the, the, the revenue of small businesses mm -hmm. which correlates to the value. And so it is one of those moments where we can take a pause and we can say, what do I need to do? What do I need to change long term to kind of get into the future as a business? And for us, we're somewhat led by our clients. If our clients want to go really far into the future from a digital standpoint, that gives us the room to do that with them and to partner with them to do it. But if our clients have a limited appetite to do it, then, then it's, it's trickier mm -hmm. and you know, we have to kind of do that dance together. So I do think that this moment, as you say, is a moment for us to come together but it's a moment for us to, to see what are those things that are needed. And I want to acknowledge there's a lot of people out there that it's like just figuring out how to keep the lights on for one more day is the reality. And I'm in that boat with you. So it's not that I'm not thinking about that, but I'm thinking both in the very short term and also in the very long term. I'm thinking about 20 years from now or 10 years from now, 30 years yeah. from now, pick a number that works for you based on where you're at in your career. Looking back on this moment, how do I want to have handled it? And what I told my team, I like to, I'm like a mountaineer sometimes. I like to go in the mountains. In the mountains, they have something called type one and type two fun. Type one fun is where you enjoy it at the time. And type two fun is where you're proud looking back on it. And it was like a growth moment, even though it was painful to grow in that way. And I'm telling my team, let's try to make this type one fun where we can, because we need that just to survive. We need that to, to stay in a good mental fitness place. We have to put our health first. So let's figure out how to make the best we can out of this really horrific crisis and tragic situation. But at a minimum, let's make sure that the way we behave in this moment is something that we are proud of for the rest of our lives. And I think about 2008, how we were faced with very similar decisions and the way we were able to accelerate outside of 2008, beyond in 2009, 10, 11, mm -hmm. it was based on the fact that we had proof now because everybody says the right thing when the times are good. Sure. And in a crisis, you see a huge differentiation between the companies that are really run trying to serve their community and companies that are run in more of kind of like a selfish way or whatnot. And I'm not here to mm -hmm. say one's better than the other or anything like that. But what I am here to say is it's nice for all of us to know where everybody stands and to have transparency into all those different things. And so I think it, it is a moment right now where you can take those tactical steps to get into kind of the future, get your business future-proofed and that will help you with your reopening. But I also say that you have a moment right now with the tough decisions you make to really show people what you're made of. And I think this crisis is so horrific and so deep. I think that our memories about it will last a long time. And I think those businesses out there that really do everything they can, I don't mean in a perfectionist way. We've mm -hmm. been able to avoid layoffs, but a lot of other businesses have not. So I don't mean as a perfectionist, but I mean doing everything you can, the best you can, to put you know, your mission, your purpose as a company, your purpose as a practice first. I think people are gonna remember it for a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, uh, someone was talking to me the other day and they mentioned you know, they, they had a decent program of getting online reviews. And they said, well, but I'm not, I'm not getting reviews right now, or I'm not really trying to get reviews. And I'm like, why not? Like the, the reviews you get right now, I would stay at home. I couldn't go anywhere. They provide a curbside service. So I had my hearing instrument fixed. This is the most wonderful service I've ever, like 
that is ha that, that review has some pretty solid impact versus, I mean, some really good ones in sort of, you know, pre COVID normal times of I had a great experience with them. Sure. But you know, obviously, uh, we all show our true colors, right? When, when things get challenging, um, a lot of people on this call are leaders, as you mentioned. And one thing I keep reminding myself is that, is that people are watching. I mean, your employees are watching, your patients are watching, your community is watching and not like to put any more stress to it, but it kind of, for me, it reframes a little bit that, yeah, like I need to be, uh, I need to be a leader here. I need to be, uh, you know, uh, bring some new ideas out. I need to experiment. If there's ever a time in your business, you're going to experiment. Now's probably about the best time because everyone's looking for that, right? I mean, if you say, hey, we're trying out this sort of new mode of care. You know, I've heard of some audiologists who are reconfiguring their space, right? And I could just imagine they're probably just chucking chairs to the side and moving a desk and whatever. And they're having the patient in one room, they're in another, separate entrances, video monitors set up in each. They never actually see, it's the same thing we're doing here, right? And they conduct an entire evaluation that way, right? Mm -hmm. Would have never, ever thought of doing that, obviously, pre a couple weeks ago. But for those patients that say their cat ate their hearing aids, and they really need their hearing aids, those yeah. providers are going the extra mile. They're, they're finding ways to get it done. Uh, you know, one of the bigger uh, referral sources within audiology and hearing healthcare practices is patient referrals. We start to come out of this, or even, I even say we're still in it, you know, with people with hearing needs are going to say, yeah, they had this all set up. They had basically a touchless system, uh, maybe not entirely touchless, but they had thought through every step. Um, that's pretty powerful. And once again, like, the community is watching. The physicians that refer to practices are watching. Uh, so in that way, while you're, I completely agree with what you're saying, it, it's incredibly challenging. The opportunity is, hey, just you can you can try what you want right now. I mean, uh, people are going to be open for it. Uh, virtual health is is going to be expected by patients now. Like even for getting COVID, say COVID magic goes away in a month, it's not going to. If it went away in a month, patients are still going to expect virtual health care. Yeah. You know, so we need to be positioned for that as well. I think too, never underestimate the power of stories. Like at Gravity, there was one time when I started the company for the first four or five years, all of our customers had access to me 24 hours a day, which was <clears throat> arguably not the right like relationship or lifestyle decision, but it was a powerful statement of accountability that I was able to make. You know, now we're, we're 16 plus years in. Mm -hmm. and we have 20,000 customers, but at that time, maybe we had five or 600 customers and, you know, maybe 10 employees. And there was this story of one time uh, a teriyaki shop around the street from me called into that number and they, they made a mistake, but they just need a little bit of help. And I was like, you know, in my PJs, it was like midnight. And I just threw on, you know, some clothes real quick and went around the corner to help them out in person because English was their second language and they had a hard time with our phone system or just talk, speaking over the phone at all. And that story of like, how did we as a company help this one customer, you know, that got told how many different times. And so I think a lot of audiology practice owners and your, and your teams right now are creating stories that will be told for years. And sometimes it might not like totally pencil out in a sustainable way. And I think that's one of the things that's beautiful about love and individual choices and all that. It's not always like rationally profitable. Like the amount of time you spend in every situation is not necessarily profitable for how much money you make but I think it shows where you stand. So I think the stories that you all can create in your industry and, and for an individual practice owner right now will be a very powerful marketing tool. And when you, when you mention like referrals from those primary healthcare providers, those are those hooks that, those, that will stick in that provider's mind. Right. If you can have that story that's like a hook and it's like, most of the time, the best stories, they weren't set out with any intention to create a marketing story. They were just people being human beings mm -hmm. in an economy that is not always so human anymore. And I, I've seen that potential so strongly with your audiology practice owners 
of they have that shared humanity and care for their employees, but even more so for their clients. And so some of those stories and connecting it to that primary, you know, practice refer. I mean, I, I think that those are the things that can create like a lifetime of, of legacy and value for a business. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of doing the same types of things that, that practice owners and, and, and staff have been doing just in a different way, right? I mean, it's always been about the patient care, but now we need to reach out further. You know, we need to find a different medium for that and we need to, we need to embrace it because um, uh, like you said, it's going to be remembered. Um, and, and, and as we go through this, I mean, in, in, you um, obviously have a much better view of the overall kind of economics of this and how it's affecting different industries and that type of thing. When I look at hearing healthcare in particular, one thing I'm optimistic about is that of course, uh, hearing loss is still, it still exists, right? Uh, so, so patients that would have likely been new patients today, right, aren't typically coming in. Some, by the way, and, and there's, there's a mix, some clinics are still open, some clinics are seeing restricted levels, some are completely closed. So I don't mean to paint with too wide of a brush, but patients that typically would have been new today are obviously still going to have their hearing loss in a month or two, right? Um, and so while we might not get all those patients in, or it might take longer, uh, I think there's reason for optimism within the hearing healthcare space that we'll see likely a quicker recovery. We'll build a, you know, there may be a time when we have more new patients than we're accustomed to. Whereas, of course, on the, maybe the restaurant side, unfortunately, they're not going to sell those hors d'oeuvres and appetizers and, and, mm -hmm. and, and drinks that they would have sold, you know, in April. Um, so that's sort of one of the things because I think you're of, having in, a pent yeah. up demand right now, which that's is right. going to be unleashed at some point. Right. Right. And so the stuff you're doing now mm -hmm is, I mean, it's not dirty to think of as marketing, uh, to think of the innovative solutions you have, so you're prepared. Because infection control, for example, is going to be a massive issue, I shouldn't say issue, uh, a massive uh, point of emphasis going forward. Yeah. Right? There's no, it's not going to be like, hey, in two years, we can forget about infection control. Uh, it, it's it's going to be standard of practice now at a high level versus, um, you know, some varying standards before. So, uh, yeah, I think definitely an opportunity. Hey, do you want to hit some of these questions, Brian? Yes, please. So I got one of them here. Many of us did not get the PPP. So um, I hear you and I, I was one of those people until today. And I have been advocating uh, very strongly on my Twitter feed and, and I've been going on TV and I've been calling out larger companies that have other options that have taken that. I've been trying to encourage people to um, recognize that if you take the PPP loan, that means somebody else isn't getting it. So really ask yourself, was this meant and designed not just in the law, but in the spirit of the law for, for me? And I think for everybody on this call, I would encourage you that the answer is likely yes. And so if you've not applied for the PPP, I really would encourage you to, to strongly consider it. I do think that the small businesses that are represented here are exactly the, the people that this is intended for. And so while I do take it very seriously, and just to talk about a little bit how it works, essentially whatever money you spend on payroll up to $100,000 per employee in the eight weeks after you are approved and funded turns into a grant. So essentially the US taxpayer is going to be covering a, a portion of your payroll for the eight weeks after you take it. But those employees can continue to be productive, can continue to go out there and, and try to do implement some of these strategies that Brian is talking about. And it's not only seeing patients, but it's also getting the company structured in the right way to allow you to be ready to handle the potential for a, a far increased demand after all of this. And so I do want to acknowledge that getting those systems set up, getting some of that marketing and branding set up, and then also getting the systems infrastructure set up to be able to handle patients coming through right now, you may have a big surge and it's a good time to think about doing that. And the US government decided that they would rather have those uh, people receiving their pay and have them working because the US government's thinking they're gonna need government assistance either via, via unemployment benefits or subsidizing payroll. It's one or the other. And they would rather build and invest in your company and see you succeed during these eight weeks. And then whatever portion of funds don't turn into a grant, turn into a loan 
with 1% interest that has to be paid back in two years. So likely part of it will turn into a grant. And if you under, under uh, budget how much you need, maybe the entire thing could turn into a grant. But if you fully budget what you qualify for, likely a certain part of it will turn into a loan and that will need to be paid back in two years. But that might be able to bridge that gap for you a little bit in terms of seeing those patients. So I would encourage you to apply for the PPP. Uh, you can decide if you trust this or not, but the, te the Treasury Secretary, uh, Steven Mnuchin, has said that they are not going to turn away businesses that qualify. And I think almost every business here would qualify. And you might even think about some of your employees that maybe were doing something else before, and now you can have them working on client reach outs. Maybe you yeah. could do a conference call like this with some of your patients, uh, education. You all will know what to do better on that, but I would just encourage you that you may wanna consider taking a second look at the PPP. And if you're still waiting, um, hopefully that comes through quickly. Unfortunately, a lot of the big banks gave it to their large clients first, their clients that had previously had a lending relationship because that helps the bank. Um, that is wrong and, and unfair, and I've said that publicly many times, so that's not news. But what's also true is the banks get a 5% commission with no risk just for getting that money to you. Uh, so that's also probably kind of unfair, but it's an incentive for the bank to get that money to you. So even if you didn't qualify in that first round, if it, I shouldn't say didn't qualify, even if you didn't get funded or didn't get good service from the bank in the first round, think about it in the second round. And my email address is just dprice at gravitypayments.com. If you need to get connected to a bank or a financial institution and need help, email me and I'll connect you with somebody at Gravity. We made a promise that if we got the PPP loan, we are gonna put some resources aside to help other people get it that are more deserving or equally deserving than we are because we take that as a huge responsibility. So that's one. Um, uh, this one's for you, Brian. Um, can you share more uh, what practice owners are employing to stay in touch with clients and gain new ones? Yeah, so some of the methods, um, you know, there's there's automated methods uh, within several office management systems, Counselor has them as well for automated marketing emails to go out. So these are simple things. These are, you know, when's the patient's birthday, you know, they're getting, and you can customize the messages, of course, uh, warranty reminders, you know, um, you think about the patients whose hearing instrument warranty comes up for renewal at the end of this month, well, maybe we don't get back in touch with them until August, and they say, oh, I, you know, I needed to know that. And from the practice standpoint, oftentimes warranty renewals don't get a lot of attention because there's not a ton of margin on it. I mean, I don't mean to say it in a bad way. It's just we're busy, right? And so you don't necessarily seek out those warranty extensions. But now we may have some time. So Dan just talked about, you know, staff having some opportunity. I would personally be very assertive in reaching out to patients and saying, hey, we noticed your, your warranty is up. Let's make sure we do any service now. Do we need to extend this? Um, you know, and you could really spend some time talking with patients directly there. I, um, it, go ahead, can I jump in on that? And then I'll, I'll have you jump in again. Yeah. One of the things that I've noticed in this is vulnerability has never been more allowed or rewarded than right now. I went out and publicly have said, we're losing money and we're like going to have trouble making it. And I've had, I've told that to millions of people and I could count on one hand, the number of people that have said, well, I don't want to do business with you anymore because of it. I'm not sure. saying it would never happen, but there are very few people that would say that right now versus if, if it were boom times and everyone's doing great and you say that, it might be different. So I think this relates to another question that came up of like, how do you get people to give you reviews and all those things? I think mm -hmm. some honesty and vulnerability of like, you know, this is the situation we're in. And I have been receiving dozens of messages pretty much every day from customers, from people in the community that appreciate our transparency, vulnerability. And, you know, every customer I talk to now seems like they want to tell me, hey, just so you know, you always have been loyal to us. You've always been there for us. So I've gotten so much encouragement, but it's tempting for me to not say, hey, can you give me a review or can you do this or can you do that? Even though many of our customers and many of your customers uh, for, your, for your audiology practice, for all the folks out there, are looking to help you through this crisis. They're looking to do what they can right now in a way that they weren't before. Yeah, and, and I, I would say, I, I know I, I've, 
I felt comfortable in a very soft approach asking for reviews in my in my practice, and it was and it was just um, usually pretty simple. Uh, you know, one of the best ways that this my practice uh, grows is by you talking about us. And so, if you could mention us, that would be wonderful. Now, like you said, being vulnerable, uh, if you were to send out a mass email and say. Here, I mean, first off, you start off with the, with the value offering. So, what you're providing. Here are the you know services we're providing. Uh, this is what we're doing internally. This is how we're preparing. Like I mentioned, that email from the clinic in Colorado. They there, there's a lot of talking to the camera too, and, and not everyone's comfortable with that right away. But you don't have to be good. I mean, you can record a video really simply, talking to the camera, telling your patients what's going on, right? Just, and, and, and to extend it to a question I saw sort of about acquiring new patients or encouraging new patients, I would take that message to Facebook. I would take that message, you know, potential LinkedIn or other venues mm -hmm. and just say, you know, we love our patients. We love our patients. You are the reason we're here. And it's so important that we continue to provide amazing care to you. Here are the things we're doing. Our staff is all in right? We're all in today. We're all in next month. We're all in five years down the road and just start to genuine that. I mean, you're, cause you're talking right to them. Um, so whether you're, you know, specifically asking for reviews, you could have a link at the bottom of the email for that. Um, but you're generating that uh, very good vibe. I think very easily too, this is not an expensive thing. This is not an investment. This is a, have a laptop like I do right now, have, you know, YouTube, whatever it is, record it and and you're in good shape. So I don't know if I quite answered the question there. I, I, I think was, also but. right now there's an increased focus on self-care. There's mm -hmm. an increased focus on quality of life. And I know one of the biggest um, obstacles that an audiologist faces in acquiring new customers is somebody just kind of accepting a subpar experience of life because sure. they don't have optimal hearing and they're just going to live with it, you know, for whatever reason. And I think right now is a time to encourage people to really take care of themselves and to have the best quality of life, best relationships, best connections that you can. Because if you think about, you all are, you, you focus on hearing health, but there's an, an amazing connection between hearing health and mental health. Mm -hmm. When people are not struggling to here, they're having better relationships with their friends and family members. And those relationships improve immune response. So, you know, those are some links that maybe are hard to sell, but they're absolutely true. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think right now there is a moment where people are pausing and saying, you know, am I doing a good job taking care of myself? I know I have, and I know our team has. And what do I need to do to take care of myself better? So I think that message could, you know, potentially have, there's a couple sure. quick tactical questions here that I just want to get out of the way. Can you apply to several sources for the PPP loan? Uh, obviously, you know, ask your accountant and your lawyer and all that, but from everything I've heard, you absolutely can apply from several sources. And those sources have a lot of discretion right now of who they prioritize first. So you may want to think about applying for a couple sources. The downside of that is it's so much extra work for little upside. So if the program was more organized, uh, if it was set up a little bit better for you, then you wouldn't have to think about all that stress of doing that and going through that twice. But I have heard from many people that they've applied a second time and that the, the second person that they applied to uh, gave that gave it to them and the first person they haven't heard back from another uh, tip that i heard from my banker and i can't verify this independently but he's a very good banker and i trust him he told me that 75 percent of the loans that had been deployed at a certain point had gone through community banks and that the larger banks the chases and the b of a's and the u.s banks that everyone expected the key banks that everyone expected to do well they were so focused on their bigger clients that the smaller clients did not get the, the, the respect that they deserved in that relationship. And especially if you hadn't had a prior lending relationship, they were having a harder time getting to you. So if you've applied to a big name bank in particular, I would encourage you to, to seek some advice from your accountant or think about if you may want to apply to a smaller community bank. We also at Gravity have relationships 
with um, more online banks and fintechs, not formal relationships, but we just want to be helpful. And so that team can connect you with some of those resources. Again, if you want to email me or reach out to your rep at Gravity, we can, we can connect those dots there. Uh, let's see, I'm looking for some more. Um, any suggestions for handling employees who prefer not to come back to work, either because they're making more on unemployment or because they think it's too soon from a safety standpoint? You know, that's a tough one. And I think that, um, I think the comfort level of people with their health is a really tricky situation right now that needs a lot of respect. So I think my number one uh, piece of advice would be to really listen and try to put yourself in their shoes, try to understand the way they see the world. Um, from an unemployment standpoint, most people, not everybody, but most people do not want to be on unemployment any longer than they need to, and they would rather be working. There's a lot of benefits to working that have nothing, that has nothing to do with just the money of it. It's the purpose, it's all those things. But I will say, aside from health concerns, which I think is very valid, if you have folks that just would prefer not to work, they might not be the right people for your practice long term. That's not the case with everybody. If they have extenuating circumstances, if they have somebody they're caring for at home or they have uh, school age kids at home and there's other complicating factors, I would take those very seriously. But if there's somebody that says, I just want to sit home and watch Netflix and get paid for it, that might not be your best long term bet in, in an employee. And, you know, I don't know, you know, what conversation you might have, but I've found that. When I have a distance between me and an and a employee at Gravity, somebody that I work with, getting everything out on the table and just being very transparent is uniting, not from a judgmental standpoint or a what I think standpoint, but just what are the facts right now? And the facts are that 22 million people have been laid off in the last month. And it's becoming worse. And so having a job has a lot of benefits, which I don't need to go into because you all know, but having a job and being able to work through this experience, I'm telling my team, and I told them today and yesterday and pretty much every day, what we learn through this experience will serve us for the rest of our lives, 100%. And this is the type of valuable experience that turns somebody from being a follower or somebody you have to keep an eye on, somebody that's not doing so well, into a leader. And so I would present that employee with the opportunity that they have to do more, to be a leader, but then that means you have to trust them enough to give them the bandwidth to make that transition. And that's a difficult thing. And it requires both of you to have a huge amount of patience with each other because you're gonna get maybe frustrated sometimes or say, I wish you would have done it this way. And they might hear it when you say, I wish you would have done it this way. They might hear it as that they're not a good employee, that they're you know, not a valuable person, that you don't like them. Those aren't things that you're saying. So you're gonna have to be patient with the fact that they're gonna have to sift through those messages. But I think that real vulnerability and transparency and tell your employees the things you're not supposed to tell them in terms of that the corporations, the big employers would keep secret because you have a, an opportunity to, to have such a positive impact on this person's career right now, but you need to inspire them. So if, if they're not responding to your leadership, go first with how can you change? How can you become a more inspirational leader and make the kind of um, the more situations where you're going to have to make a negative decision that affects them or you're going to have to view them in a more negative light put th put that down try four five six times to rephrase things and represent things so that they can see that your practice and that their work improves people's lives improves people's relationships i believe improves people's immune response help them to see the bigger picture and take it first as a cue that you need to communicate the benefits to them, to their society, to the values that they care about first and foremost. And things like extrinsic rewards, money, having a job, all those things, it, to the extent you can, let that be second. And the way we think about it is, at Gravity is, as a CEO, I try to envision that everybody that works at Gravity is independently wealthy and they're showing up volunteering because what we do matters that much. It's kind of a pipe dream and it's never at that level, but if you shoot for that level, 
I think you'll find that you have a staff that's more consistently motivated. And I think right now is the time to, to communicate with your staff about the importance of, of what y'all do and, and the value you provide to your community. What would you say, Brian? Well, I agree. And I also say you can give them some work. I mean, so one of the lovely things about this, I think I assume it really lovely, but um, you can I say, lovely. yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I understand where you're coming from. Um, here's, here's some things we can do. This isn't necessarily a long-term solution, but we're taking this day by day anyway. So why not take this? Uh, I'm going to put you in charge of telehealth. Uh, here is a list of patients we can generate from the system that we need to reach out to. So I'd like you to work with so-and-so. We're going to schedule these patients or do on demand. This is either going to be face-to-face -face telehealth or you're going to call them. I need you to check in and make sure what their needs are. I need to find out if they need a captioned phone, right? This isn't anything that practice necessarily makes you money off of, but would be a value to the patient. This is stuff that we never would have time for typically in our practice. Now, where this goes long term is okay. So, like, as Dan is saying, you know, in some cases, cases uh, obviously employees would, would embrace this challenge. And while I'm being supported working at home and I can still provide value to my patients, and as we transition, to some new level of normalcy, you now have a robust telehealth patient connection program. This person is essentially led, right, from their home uh, and that you can then transition right into your normal practice. And several questions have popped up about, you know, how do I, you know, keep connecting with patients and asking about remote testing and those types of things. There's a lot of this technology that's evolving right now. Uh, there's uh, different systems being built. So you can pull up to someone's driveway, leave a, a briefcase on their door, go back to your car and do testing, right? These are all sort of being developed right now. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff that's gonna be required going forward. I mean, if someone's immunosuppressed, uh, there, another question was, when do you think patients will feel coming in, you know, com comfortable coming in? Two months, six months, 12 months. That's tricky. That depends on where you live. That depends on the patient's specific, you know, health concerns, um, even what media they consume, right? I mean, this is a lot of factors in this. So if you can say, look, I'm going to meet you where you're at, whether you are the employee, I'm going to meet you where you're at, whether you're the patient, right? And we're going to have, you know, we're going to use some technology here to, to make that connection and keep our practice moving forward. It isn't always profitable immediately right? Those calls, those telehealth the pay, that the provider is making probably aren't being charged for, right? But you're making that connection. Now, in addition, I might also challenge that employee or different employees to expand their uh, abilities, right? One thing that can be billed for right now that isn't typically included under insurance payers is tinnitus rehab, right? You can have, just like counseling, right? You can have, you can have uh, telehealth sessions, you can charge for it, I would challenge, um, you know, my staff, let's, you know, we've talked about becoming a, a balanced clinic as well and finding some cost effective ways to provide balanced rehab training, uh, tinnitus rehab, potentially APD. I know some awesome classes out there right now in APD. Uh, there's a lot you can do right now. No one ever has time to do 20 hours of CUs, but except for now. Uh, so I would, I would, you know, challenge those employees to really use this time well in a variety of ways. So there's a bunch of questions. Let's just try to take the let next three minutes and rapid fire all that we can. Uh, somebody says, if somebody decides to quit and you get PPP for that person, you hire another, does that turn in the loan amount of PPP? Again, ask your accountant and lawyer. I'm, I, I'm not qualified to give advice on this type of thing, but my understanding or what I've heard other people say is that if somebody quits and you hire a replacement, then the PPP works and it's basically as if that person didn't quit. Um, if an employee doesn't wanna come back and is on an unemployment, can you terminate them and when is this allowed? Um, yeah, I mean, if they don't show up to work and you have work for them, uh, you can terminate them, but there are exceptions. So you need to work with your accountant or your lawyer on that because there are exceptions that relate to their health if they're caring for somebody, if they're sick, those types of things. We don't want people coming back to work that are either caring for somebody that's sick or is sick. And so there may be other exceptions, but I know there are specific exceptions. Um, have you had experience with the CARES Act for an employee that still wants to work? Yes, that, that's exactly what it's designed for is to keep people working. So that's kind of how it's designed is to allow you to keep them on payroll for eight weeks and hopefully use that as a mechanism to, to recover um, uh, so, uh, 
uh, Bill is asking about, you know, ideas related to like waiting room time, extended appointment times, et cetera. Brian, what do you have to say with that? Because I, I think if we can get that queuing and payment system and all that outside of the office, you know, maybe people can prepay for appointments. Maybe they can kind of show up right when the appointment's supposed to start and maybe have a little bit of time between appointments for the, for the audiologist to have a little break. How, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I totally agree. So some of that stuff that we, you know, people have been telling us they're working on and we've been assisting people with is remote payment for one thing. Um, the, you know, we're not going to be handing cash back and forth for quite a while. If we don't have to hand a credit card back and forth, all the better. So, you know, um, but yeah, staggered scheduling is certainly important. Uh, a lot of people have really looked, taken a close look at their space as well. Uh, there's a clinic here in Illinois uh, that bought extra long cords and is actually testing people in their car. So they go through a window, they're testing in their car. And this gets to a question someone else asked about online testing. Um, that's all going to be state specific as far as what you need for a compliant, for an, an official audiogram. So whether you need SRT, PTA, you know, uh, SRT, word rec, uh, you know, um, um, MCLs, UCLs, those types of thresholds. So you definitely want to know your state uh, guidelines and what you need in order to complete uh, a, a test, but then understand that there's going to be some flexibility with this. Uh, so no one's going out with a noise level meter level meter in that patient's car, but I'm sorry, like an official standpoint, this clinic has, and they've found that it, it's actually a fairly good testing environment. Point being is that, uh, you know, Bill had also mentioned um, extended point, uh, appointment times. We just have to look at the entire way we provide care and figure out how it can work. Um, yeah. Hey, Meg, on your, your question on temps, as far as I can tell, the PPP is not designed very well for that. And that is, I think, a hole in the program. So I don't have any specific advice. Feel free to email me um, or Brian if you want to chat more about it. But it's unfortunately, it's not set up. It's set up better for employees, but not really contractors and temps. It, it, it's not set up well for it all from everything that I've read and can tell. Um, The thing that, Alicia, what, what do I wish that I could tell every business owner now? Um, I think you can differentiate yourself more right now than ever before. You can make a bigger difference for what you care about. It's probably not making money or you would have picked a different industry and I would have taken a different approach to my industry, but it might be. Even making money, whatever it is, you can make a bigger difference right now because it's a real, it's an impossible, challenging situation. And if you can rise and overcome that, you differentiate yourself so much. And I feel bad about the fact that the larger companies are seeing that and taking advantage of it. And my job is just to help the small independently run and own businesses keep up. You know, that's like a hundred percent. If I do that, then I think I will have deserved to keep my job. Um, and if I don't, then I won't. So that's just what I'm thinking about every day. Um, how do we keep our, our staff involved and engaged? I would be honest with them about what a, what a horrible situation with it, this is for your business, what the numbers are. And I would really use this as a chance to not look at where they are, but how much improvement they can make in their understanding of your business, of the economics, of the purpose, how it operates. I would use this, use the, 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 the difficult challenge of the situation of the crisis as a way to inspire learning. We have a bunch more questions, Brian, but we are out of time. Um, so I wonder if maybe we can uh, do some individual follow-ups or put together some sure. type of an email summary, something like that. I'd, I'd really enjoy that if we could. Um, so I, I appreciate everybody making the time, um, uh, having me. Thank you, Brian, for making the time to do this. I yeah, really appreciate am it. really bummed uh, that I'm not with you all in person. Honestly, like this industry is, probably one of the best experiences I've ever had. Uh, the conference that I spoke at that you all hosted me at, like I just couldn't get enough of meeting everybody and hearing their stories and everything. That's not always the case. So it's really, really fun for me to be involved with this. And, you know, it's not like a huge part of Gravity's business, but it is an important part to me personally. And it is an important part for us as a company as well. And we just appreciate the leadership that you've shown, Brian, through all this crisis. I really admire the way you run your business. I really admire how you're in it to help those who are helping others with their hearing health. 
I, I think that's really, really wonderful and makes a big difference. And I just want to say thank you for all the work you're doing and the fact that you're not letting this paralyze you at all. You're using it to inspire and motivate you to do more. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. That's very nice. And um, I appreciate your insight. Uh, once again, I give you have a much better, larger scope of the larger uh, economy on this. And I think it's really easy to, to get in our heads in our own business. Um, I think there's there's a lot of reason to be hopeful for our profession, for audiology. There's a lot of changes already that are occurring. This just feeds into things that we need to do to be better prepared for the future anyway. So um, I, I'm, I'm optimistic um, and I really, really thank everyone for joining and thank you, Dan. You all can make such a big difference. You can, it's a horrible situation, but we can come together, we can make a big difference. So let's all stay in touch and whatever we can do at Gravity to help you all let us know.